Welcome to DevOx Belgium, everybody. So welcome to the 17th edition. That means it's still three years for the 20th edition. And I am hope for the 20th edition we can have the same movie, but then for Mars, who knows, right? I hope Ellen, go Ellen. So, <laughs> we can start. So nine months of preparation, um, lots of emotional roller coasters. In June, we were all set. Yeah, registration ready, CFP is ready, all go, tweet. And then this happened. Boom! Everything was on fire. We got more, we've never had more than a thousand proposals. We had a thousand sixty proposals from more than 800 speakers. The registration, we sold out in July and we hadn't announced a single speaker. And it was sold out. So we have blind birds and that's it. That does create a bit of a management type of challenge because we had 800 speakers of which 600 would get rejected. And a lot of those speakers, then they hope that they, okay, if they don't get a speaker ticket, they will just buy one. But it was already sold out. So you can imagine like the, uh, the, the frantic uh, situation and the, like even sponsors. We, we sold out the sponsors, uh, uh, the exhibition floor. We had a waiting list for sponsors. And we had another 500 people also on the waiting list to actually come to this event. So you can imagine, it's a positive problem, I'm not complaining, but you do need to manage this. And you go like, what the hell? Now, nevertheless, with a great team and my partner in crime, uh, Christine, we did a great job, we managed it, we allocated 300 tickets in the side, people could register, but you know, it was a bit of juggling. But afterwards, all is fine, and you are here, you can enjoy it. Now, it does mean, I had to top it at 3,200. We did not allow 3,500, which we've done in the previous year. So you have a bit more space, but it will still be very crowded. Be professional. I have the biggest stress when it's lunch, because then everybody goes to the exhibition floor. We're going to be distributing uh, the, the, the famous uh, crab sandwiches and the salads also upstairs. Um, but just be professional, take your time. Um, also for the rooms, if the rooms are full, we are streaming all the talks live on Periscope and YouTube. All the sessions from yesterday and the day before are already available for free with no advertisements and so on. So you will not have to miss a single second of all the talks. So, I would like to thank, of course, the, the team. I mean, Christine and I, we run all the admin and so on, but without the team, there would not be any registration, there would not be any review of the sessions, uh, and all like running around with tables and water. So a big applause to my team. There's still a few actually working at the registration desk, but uh, let's have a great applause for them. Thank you very much for helping out. It takes a small village to actually make this happen, uh, so thank you. And of course, without speakers, there would not be a DevOps either. Um, we, I think we have about 220 speakers, something about around that, that number. I would like to thank all the speakers. They come from all over the world to share the knowledge. And uh, thank you very much to, to do that effort. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's just amazing. Uh, and again, there, it's, it's just beautiful to see. We, we try to... Uh, you know, we try to find a balance also from track's point of view, diversity, that it's really such a multi-dimensional effort that it's always inter interesting to see how it actually ends out. Um, and and that's, that's another thing, is like, what we do, because we had 1,060 proposals, our program committee is only, we were only with 20 people. If we have to review 1,060, it's just way too much work. So we have a concept called golden tickets. So the first 600 people who register, they get the chance to actually also vote on the talks. And this is the, the top uh, people who actually voted. There's actually Jan Vissers. He actually went through 1,000 talks, which is quite a lot. It might be his cat as well. I don't know. Maybe his cat is called Schroeder or something. I don't know. Um, but nevertheless, we had 96 active uh, people from the Golden Tickets reviewing sessions as well. And we do take that into account when we actually take the selections of the, of the talks and the speakers. So thank you all for, for helping out. It's a community event. It's a community effort. Uh, and that's really great. I really appreciate that. Um, without speakers, without the team, 
you know, that's just one part of the equation. A big equation to make the entrance fee as low as possible is, of course, our sponsors. So I would like to thank Pivotal, JetBrains, ING, and Google Cloud, or Google, uh, to support us. And there are many more. There's always a few new companies who actually join us uh, on a yearly basis. And luckily, this year, actually, Microsoft got in, because last year, I had to reject them because we hadn't any space left. So we were like, that's always a good feeling to say like, to Microsoft, yeah, sorry, we're full. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I use Mac. No, but I'm joking. I mean, they got some interesting uh, things going on with Java and Azure and so on. So we're glad that they could join us. Same for Amazon. It's the first time that they're here at DevOps Belgium. They were actually at DevOps France already. Uh, so it's good to, be the, to welcome them. And many others, uh, as you can see from this list, it, it really, again, is a, a community effort. And it's great to have their support. So thank you to all the, so the sponsors. Make sure you go to their booth, get the merchandising. There's some really cool t-shirts that I've saw. Uh, make sure you check that out. All right. Another one which I would like to thank is all the top companies which are here. These are really the companies which have a, I have a lot of respect for. Because if you look at this list, ING, Arns Group, Quintor again, Ball.com, a lot of actually companies from the Netherlands, uh, which is uh, amazing because they got a great event already, which, is, which was uh, previous week, which is JFall. Um, but yeah, they sell out in like, what is it, four days as well? Or it's, it's also four days, right? So, um, but like, I know Quintor, they wanted to come here with 85 people, but we had already sold out, again, the, the registration. And they were like, come on, now we want to come with the whole team. So that's, that's amazing. It, it really becomes like part of their team building, and a lot of companies do this. Uh, it's their week uh, you know, to geek out, uh, find some old colleagues uh, and, and network, and have a few beers in the evening. And mind you, if you, who's here for the first time at DevOx? Yeah, so maybe 20%. Uh, just so a big warning this evening, Belgian beer will give you a hangover. Just watch out for that. So thank you for your support, all these companies who are here, and there's, there's many more, of course. Um, so what I wanted to do in my last uh, portion of the, the talk is to actually give you a bit of an idea, well, a bit of a view behind the scenes. Um, what you've probably noticed is that we actually have a lot of AI-related talks uh, this year, uh, machine learning uh, and deep learning and so on. And we, we, of course, I mean, I'm a developer, I like to, I mean, it's our 17th year. If I would just copy and paste every edition, I would not continue doing this because it would be boring for me. I want to actually play with technology and actually apply it also in the conference. So I want to actually introduce you to four projects and actually give you a bit of an insight how we are abusing, misusing, trying out things uh, with, with in, in, in relation to AI. And the first one is a project called the DevOps Schedule. And I would like to thank Jeffrey, uh, Pitior, and Victor. I think they're here in the room. You can just quickly stand up if they're there. So these guys, yeah, definitely applause for them. So Jeffrey has been stalking me for the last three years now, asking constantly. He, he works for Red Hat, works on OptaPlanner. And he said, like, man, I want you to really use OptaPlanner to schedule your, your event. So we have, like, and I've constantly pushed back because I didn't want to do it. But this year, it was funny. I was at DevOx Poland, and I met Pitior and Victor. And they were going like, yeah, we are doing some really great projects using Scala and AI and so on. And we could actually create your schedule using uh, constraint, constraint resolvers. And they were like pushing me. Geoffrey was pushing me and said, OK, it looks like it's time to actually try this out. So we had two teams working side to side. And the idea behind it is that I press a button, and the schedule gets generated. That's the theory. Now, of course, you need to add quite a bit of constraints to that, because then you start working. You go like, yeah, but what about crowd control? Crowd control? Yeah, if you have Venkat in room 8, you want to have another rock star speaker balancing him out, because otherwise, he's like a magnet. Everybody will go to his session, and all the other rooms will be empty. right? So you need to think about this. Uh, and of course, like for example, you don't, other constraints that you want to add is, for example, we have 10 tracks. It would be great that we have 10 tracks in one time slot. So you don't have two Java talks competing with each other, things like that. But it's a lot more complicated, actually. Once you start thinking about this, you go like, well, um, you want to make sure that, for example, a speaker uh, gives a talk, maybe like Brian, he gives two talks. And you want to have a talk in between, so that way at least he can actually decompress and then go to his other session and relax. 
Or you could have a speaker on Monday and you don't want to, that speaker to actually talk on Friday because then there's too many days in between. And there's like many other, there's many more constraints. There's about 14, 15 different constraints that we add. And there's really some cool stuff that I couldn't even do. But the obvious one is availability. Speakers say like, Trisha, she, she contacted me, say, yeah, I'm there on Wednesday afternoon and I need to go back on Thursday afternoon. So you need to add that. But if you have 217 speakers, there's a lot of constraints that you have to think about if you do this manually. In this system, you just add it, you configure it, you add all your, your favorite things like, for example, having only one session um, of a speaker in one time slot, uh, but also the, the crowd control, etc. And what even is nicer is, for example, the uh, audience level. If you have a talk very similar, but the one has mentioned it's, it's a beginner talk and the other one is an advanced talk, then the beginner talk should be scheduled first and the advanced one should be scheduled after that. All those type of things are actually taking into account in these constraint resolvers, and they basically then create a nice schedule. Uh, now, the beauty is that every time you press that button, create a schedule, it creates a new schedule. It looks like there are more, it might be that there are more, uh, what is it? Is it more than the minimum number of atoms in the observable universe of the possibilities of creating a schedule? And to get that answer, you will need to come to their session. Right? So they will be having a talk on this tomorrow at 3 o'clock, and it's basically competing the two solutions and seeing how that actually works, etc. So I will definitely uh, invite you to, to go to their, uh, to their session. So thank again, uh, Victor, Pitior and Geoffrey for, for that work. Um, that makes my life a lot easier because people go like, why did you schedule me on Monday evening? I said, hey, it's the algorithm. <laughs> it's not me. It's not me. It's AI. So cool. Now, the other one we, we did, and that's, that's one we've been struggling with every year. I don't know who was here last year. So quite a bit. So you've noticed when you came in the rooms, we have a Twitter wall. And last year, we thought it was a good idea to include images. We thought, <laughs> works at home. Until then, the DevOps hashtag trends. And all of a sudden, all these Russian bots, and it was a Russian bot last year, was hijacking our hashtag. And they were like promoting, let's say, with, uh, it wasn't gender neutral uh, pictures. Um, <laughs> And it was basically polluting our tweet wall. And I remember there was one tweet where there was this picture, and then Mario's tweet was above it, and people were going like, why did Mario tweet a naked lady? <laughs> and we went like, seriously, it was before the keynote, and we were all going like, oh, damn, what can we do? We don't have any blacklist, we don't have... So we had to really think about it and do this a bit better. Um, and that's where uh, Sven and um, his colleague really went and went all the way with Martin and, and actually said like, okay, let's add some artificial intelligence here. There's really quite a lot of interesting things I, we, we can do with this. So I would like to get Sven on stage so we can actually talk about what, what happened. And uh, Sven, welcome to DevOx. Thanks for having me. We need to give you a mic. And I'll give you the clicker so you can go through the sequence. Come over here in the, in the spotlight. All right. Don't be shy. <laughs> so what we did, let me see. Yeah, they'll, they'll switch to the slide. Ah, okay. So um, what we do is uh, we have a stream of tweets from Twitter. And um, the first thing is um, we want to trust you all. So the first thing is we do whitelisting. So everybody we know, you're in. Um, and you end up on the wall. And then we do blacklisting. So people we know, we had like a, a May, Amazon Black Friday last year, that was trending as well, and um, yeah, so we just uh, keep blacklisting those things, and they are out. And next thing we did, um, we're looking at the, the bot followers, so there are, typically bots don't have a lot of followers, so um, we filter those out, and if it's matched, they're gone. And, um, but they're still not good enough. So now we added AI. So the idea was, look at the images and try to classify them, categorize them. So we are pushing them to uh, Google Cloud Vision API. And, and just to be fair to all the other sponsors, yes, Microsoft can do this as well. Amazon can do this as well. Oracle can't, I think. But <laughs> all the other, they, they do that. Uh, they, they can actually say, yeah, it's a safe image or not, right? Yeah, so um, the, and we figured out, yeah, this is, a, uh, this is quite a good idea, and it, it works. Yeah. Um, 
but sometimes the results are really surprising, so we will have to some, some, some work to do. So if you, if you think yeah, your images should show up and they are not showing up, uh, get in contact and we try to figure out what happened. And, uh, and maybe we do some AutoML for next year and do yeah. some, some fine-tuned uh, neural and network for... And, and I noticed for this morning you had another hashtag, uh, yeah. a, a yellow one. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, last, uh, last night was some community contribution. We managed to get that wall running on OpenJDK 11. Because the wall runs on Java FX and on Java, and it now runs on Java 11, Mark, so it does work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, and just to, to finish this, so and if this is a, uh, a likely new picture, it's out, and the tweet is out. And next thing is what we are looking at into the moment is uh, using the text and doing text analysis as well. But this is even more complex because there are different categories and things you have to look at. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's an interesting hobby project. Yes, uh, I mean, you've not been following any sessions the last two days because you've just been hacking and. Oh, up to I was at Stuart's talk about a masterclass and streams. Oh, okay. so, you know, right. We're doing a lot of streams there. So oh, yeah, of course. Always yeah, good yeah. to know your stuff. Cool. Well, that sounds good, man. All right. Thank you very much. And there is a talk this evening, right? I think yeah. I've got it on the next slide. Let's go there. Um, so is it this evening? Yeah, at yeah. 8. If you yeah. want to see, the, it's open source, so you can play with it. You can donate your work if you want to have some other ideas. Feel free to, to come to the buff and get more details. Yeah. Thank and you, Sven. And if you think we should move to the IBM party, we can do this as well. Oh, yeah, IBM does that as well, right? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thank you, Sven. Thanks for having me. So another AI project we're doing, and this was unfortunately, it was a buff yesterday evening. You've probably missed it then. Uh, but this is Lynn Wirtz. Uh, she's a student. Um, and together, or under the support from Alex and the, with the help of Jan Kees, they did a very interesting project, which I call the conference pictures. So we, we produce thousands and thousands of pictures during the conference. We put it on Flickr, and it's for free. It's copyleft, so it, a lot of speakers use that picture for their avatar uh, or for their websites. But if I want to have a picture of Ray, for example, then I need to go through all those uh, albums. Now, I do know photo, what is it? Google Photos does that with already recognizing people. But I want to have an API, and they don't provide an API. So if you don't have it, we'll just build it. So that's what Lynn did. Uh, Lynn uh, is doing her thesis on this. And she basically takes all the pictures from Flickr. Uh, she, identif she creates a face ID, basically. And so if my face ID is 123, then she will show me all the pictures where 123 actually shows up. Now, we need to make sure that we also support different. If we only feed that the neural network with white people, then it would not recognize Vengat. Uh, so seriously, a neural network can be a racist. You know that, right? We've seen that before already. So you need to actually have training data, which is gender neutral, race neutral, etc. So, of course, we, we tried Venkat because, I mean, he, he, we have so many sp uh, pictures from Venkat. And what we've noticed is that if it's, uh, what is it, 98% certain that it is Venkat, then 98 and higher is actually Venkat. Yeah. But we actually use the neural network where it comes from the paparazzi uh, network. So it's, uh, it has some data from paparazzi. So even if Venkat is doing like this, or it's actually a tweet with the uh, avatar of Venkat, on the Twitter wall, it will even recognize that image from Venkat on the Twitter wall. So it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, and so that way, I will have now a dashboard, and I can just say, well, automatically, we will see that if it's 89, we'll, we'll just auto-approve uh, it. But if it's like, uh, sorry, not 89, 98. But if it's like 97, I have like a dashboard, uh, and then Jan Kees provided me this. I can say, yes, that, that is Roy, that, that is Roy, no, that this is not Roy, etc. So that way, we can actually have a nice like welcome page. Eventually, what we want to do for next year on the Vox website, when you go to Mark's uh, talk and you have the video on YouTube, we will have all the pictures from Mark from all the previous editions. So, so that's going to be really a, a cool feature. And, and uh, it's a fun project. And we'll probably open source it. And you can play with it and then use it for your own family or whatever. So uh, thank you, Lynn and the team, for making this happen. I think that's a really cool project. So thank you. So the last project I wanted to share is the one which I'm really the, the, the proudest uh, of. Um, and this is, as an organizer, uh, this has been a wet dream for me for many, many years uh, as an organizer, is the room occupancy. Because what we are missing, we are doing rating, so people can rate talks. But then you go like, OK, it's a room of like 700 people. You had 20 people who rated, and they gave you five star. But I want to know how many people were in the room. So what I'm doing, 
and this is a problem for me because I'm a bit of a perfectionist, I want to know how many people are in the room for that speaker because I really want to know how hot that topic is or how interesting the speaker is, etc. So what I do is that I run around from room to room. You often probably have, if you've been here before, you probably see me running around. I just want to know how many people are in the room. I'm just, I just, yeah, I'm just curious how hot the topic is. So the problem with that is it doesn't scale uh, from an age perspective. Um, we're not getting any younger. And um, I, to tell you a secret, every DevOps Belgium I do, I lose three kilograms. Yeah, so if you want to do a diet, a conference diet, organize a DevOps. Uh, it works because I do run quite a bit around and it's getting less and less, but like I, I remember in five years ago, I did like 21 kilometers in one day, just running around. And you just need to imagine this, this is a marathon of five days. You nearly, you don't really eat a lot. You don't sleep a lot because you're stressed out. You're thinking about the keynote speakers and the slides. So it's a very stressy environment. So we need to fix it, fix it. And of course we're developers, so we want to automate this. And we did this in DevOps US. We can automate it, I said. They got some students and they had a clicker. It's automated. In, in, in. Like, Come on, it's a technology conference. This is like low tech. I want to have a high tech solution. So some years ago, we actually worked together with IBM. And I don't know if you remember this, but we had an RFID chip in the batch. And then we had active RFID readers. And when people were entering the room, we were actually uh, counting the signals. The problem was, is that we have so many people here that if people are queuing, your body, you know, it's water, so it's blocking the signal. So we only had like 80, 75% accuracy. I mean, 75, come on. If you're doing machine learning and so on, 89 is like the standard. 98, I have a bit dyslectic, sorry. 98% is the standard. So we need to find another solution. And we actually built something since the last four months or so. And this is actually a dashboard. It's a screenshot from yesterday where we actually see in the room how many people are in and out. And this is, of course, not a project I've done alone. Uh, this was only possible with the support of Kasper and Stefan. So I would like to get them on stage here. Kasper and Stefan, you want to join me? And of course, I'm a bit of a business guy as well. So we immediately created a small company, which is called Counter AI. So welcome to DevOx. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and did it crash when all the people came in the room? Did you check already? Uh, we didn't have the time, so uh, okay. five minutes. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, let's just show you. So what we did, first of all, with machine learning, you need to have training data. So what we did last year is that we recorded the room eight with a camera on Friday, and have, people were going in and out, and that, this was our training material, right? And then you guys basically started tagging it, or what did you do? Yeah, we manually tagged a lot of images. Yeah, and that's a manual task. That's so this is actually task. an example you yeah. can see here. So yeah. this was from last year. Yeah. And so what you're seeing here is that it auto-detects if it's a person or not, and if it's moving in or out. Yeah, yeah we really sliced the video, took a lot of frames, manually added boxes and train the network, so. Okay, yeah. so that was last year. Yeah. Then we had this year. We did it, you set it up, and we saw on Monday a few issues. Uh, yeah, we, we did have a few hiccups because right now we're using a, uh, a hobby kit, let's say. So we're using a Raspberry Pi and a cheap uh, camera, um, which meant that in a dark room like this, um, we didn't have enough light to actually count the people. Um, we did have testing material, which was quite dark in terms of the colors, but still we didn't have um, an accuracy that was, that was good enough. Um, so BVRent helped us out and put, put up some lights, uh, and that helped a lot. I mean, we, um, we do agile conference organization, yeah, yeah, right? right? So I mean, we said, oh, we need some extra lights. Okay, one hour later, there's some extra lights. So that was already sorted. So we had more lights, so the camera could see the people. And then we, I, I noticed there was like this back shadow. Yeah. And all of a sudden, what, what happens, Stefan? Yeah, shadow is a, is a, is a problem. So uh, sometimes the shadow is counted as a person. Yeah. And the reason why is because last year we had um, imagery that was in a 45 angle. Yeah. Um, so that meant that the shadows kind of looked like the imagery we had last year, which meant that it was trained on that data. Yeah. Um, so we hope to fix that uh, next year. So it's basically, well, we now have lots of extra training data where we can mark, no, this is a false positive. Yeah. 
And there was also like people at half a head because yeah, of the shadow. That's because of the height of the camera as well and, and because of the shadow. So yeah. some people have a half head or no head at all. Especially when yeah, you are we should at not be in the registration. We should say like, if you have a full head, you're allowed. If you have a half head, you're yeah. not allowed. Something like that, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Something like that. Okay, but, uh, but but we can figure that out if you yeah. just mark it, and the, the machine learning algorithm will actually identify the training and data. Count yeah. headless people. Yeah. Headless we could people. have fixed it right now by just hanging up the cameras higher. But hey, it's software development, so yeah. just want to have a challenge and then. Yeah? Make sure that everything works next. And year. what's the accuracy we have now? I, I know the answer, but maybe the audience want to know. But uh, roughly, it depends. Uh, when it's not too crowded, we have ninety percent. Ninety percent already. So. Yeah, and in best and case, it's, it, it, yeah, and it's with the the problems we know. So yeah, yeah. it's so already again, quite okay. If you want to improve our accuracy, please walk in the middle of the lane. One by one, <laughs> please. One, one, by uh, one, one by one. One by one. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> That's cheating. No, don't, 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 don't trust them. That's not good. No, but uh, well, definitely we are gonna what after this in yeah. December we're gonna like market because it's a manual thing, right? We have to gonna do like a thousand pictures and then say like at, this at is at least at, at least, least a thousand, yeah. and then next year we'll have ninety-eight percent accuracy or what? what we go for it. That's what we're going for, yeah. Yeah, let's go for it. Yeah. Cool. So well, I mean that's really a cool project, isn't it? I mean, I finally can do a bit of development which is not CFP related, which is starting to get boring. But like, I've, I've also helped you guys doing the dashboard. I had some fun like with functions on Google, then using PubSub, then having competing consumers, then having the data stream, which actually gets that uh, basically um, transformation of the JSON, then to BigQuery, then with the dashboard. It's like lots of fun. I mean, you can do this. Some amazing things. It's really cool. So we're gonna see if we can actually create a company out of it. It is a company. We'll see. I mean, for the moment, it's only Devox, which is the customer. But there might be customers out there. We can count anything. So we, it's not just people. It could be cars which are moving. It could be bottles which are moving. We were just talking with one of the AV guys who said, "Yeah, I, I organize a rock concert, and the police they demand they know exactly how many people are in the the concert. So we can perfectly do that, right?" Yep. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So then I can finally stop with DevOps and do this full time. I, I would love that. Hey, if, if you can do the dashboard, then we can do the AI. So. Yeah. yeah, well, great. Well, thank you for your support, man. And you have a session tomorrow, right? Yeah. So tomorrow, what is it? At uh, 11.15, room four, if you want to know a bit more. Because what we ideally want to do is do the processing, the neural network, on the device. So they are TPUs, NPUs, so what is it? The tensor uh, process unit. Yeah, they're now going to their counter to see if everything is working. But uh, there's the TPUs and NPUs, and what we are starting to see is that there are like small boxes like this, and you just put it next to your uh, Raspberry Pi, and it can be done on the device itself. Because we need to be GDPR compliant. We, it needs to be anonymous, right? So what, we, what the device will do is just give a counter, and the counter is how many people are in the room. So, and that's, that's it. So that's ideally the, the, the goal of, of this project. Cool, so I think that's my last slide. So that's a bit of a walkthrough of what we do at, uh, at DevOx with AI to, to at least make, make me happy and not to, to get bored and just doing over and over these type of conferences. So I'm, I'm just having lots of fun. I mean, I can't wait to have this one over so I can just go back to hacking again uh, and, and have some fun. Great, so now it's time to go to the official keynotes. Uh, and I think it's, again, the next keynote speaker really doesn't need any uh, introductions, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, Mark Reynolds. All right, hello. So, job in 2018. Change is the only constant. In the past year, we've changed the Java platform in three ways that we never have before. First, we took this massive monolithic thing that had grown monotonically over time, and we sliced it up into 26 standard modules. Second, we removed the Java EE and Corba modules and some other APIs, leaving us with 19 standard modules. And third, we left behind our historically grand and majestic, but slow-moving and, frankly, unpredictable release model, in which we shipped a major release every two to five years. We replaced that with a rapid cadence release model, in which we ship a feature release every six months on a strict time-based schedule. Now, modularizing the platform and removing some modules did break a few things, and many have wondered, and understandably so, whether the Java ecosystem will be able to keep up. Taken together, all of these changes are, frankly, somewhat scary. But maybe they're not as scary as you think. 
Why did we make them? Because adapt or perish now as ever is nature's inexorable imperative, according to H.G. Wells. Or if you prefer a more modern formulation, adapt or die, <laughs> so saith Andy Grove. We must change Java in new ways because its competitive environment is very different than it was 20 years ago. There have been two big changes. One is that many popular platforms now ship new features around once a year, if not every six months. If Java is to remain competitive, we must move it forward faster. The second change is applications are now packaged and deployed in different ways than 20 years ago. Whether to the cloud or in packaged apps published in app stores, if Java is to remain competitive, we must adapt it to these new environments. Let's look at the first big change, modularizing the platform. This is where we ended up. Nice clean module graph, beautiful, easy to understand, 26 standard modules. The JDK, of course, has these standard modules plus a bunch of other non-standard modules that contain things like development and debugging tools, service providers, <clears throat> and JDK-specific APIs. This is not where we started. We started with a spaghetti bowl of tightly coupled platform components with sometimes surprising interconnections. Slicing all this up while maintaining as much compatibility as possible took years of painstaking refactoring and delicate surgery. We were finally able to deliver on that in JDK 9. Now, modularizing an old code base can be a ton of work, but modularizing the platform yielded many benefits. One benefit is that it's more flexible. A module names the modules upon which it depends, so the module system can ensure the reliable configuration of consistent subsets of the platform. Most applications, after all, don't need all of these modules. If you have an app that only uses the SQL module and the base module, then you can link a custom runtime system that contains just those two modules plus any others that they need. You can package this custom runtime system with your app in smaller Docker images, smaller app store packages, things that are tens of megabytes rather than hundreds. To do this, you don't need to modularize your app. You can do that if you want. There are many good reasons to do so but it can be an awful lot of work, and it's probably not worth it. If you have a big app that's in maintenance mode, is not going to change much, then it may well be best to let it be and don't bother with modularizing it. That's, that's okay. Another benefit of the modular platform is that it's more secure. A module exports specific packages only for use by the modules that depend upon it, so the module system can enforce strong encapsulation. How much more secure is it? Of the six high-impact, zero-day vulnerabilities reported since JDK 7 in 2011, three of them would have been prevented if we had been able to strongly encapsulate the JDK's internal APIs. A final benefit of the modular platform is that it's easier to maintain. Yes, the JDK does contain many internal APIs that were never meant to be used by external code, for decades, we've been warning developers against using these. They've done that anyway, of course, sometimes in some disturbingly popular libraries. Now, to be fair, in some cases, they were after critical functionality that they could get no other way, such as some of that, that which is found in the Sun Misc Unsafe class. In many cases, like all of us can be from time to time, they were just lazy. Why write your own base64 decoder if there's a perfectly good one over in the Sun Misc package? For 20 years, we've therefore treated many internal APIs as if they were standard. We've been reluctant to change them because we don't want to break people's code. But this has made the platform harder to maintain and harder to evolve. With strong encapsulation, we can close off all access to the internal APIs of the JDK, simply by not exporting the packages that contain them. Now, if we did that right away, we would definitely break a lot of existing code. So we're taking a more gradual, nuanced approach, since migration takes time, especially in such a large ecosystem. Starting with JDK 9, and at least through JDK 11, if your code uses JDK internal APIs, then it will not compile, but it will run, yet it may generate warnings at runtime. Now, by your code, 
I mean, not just the code that you write yourself, but all that useful stuff that you've downloaded from Maven Central and, and merged into your app. We've deliberately relaxed the strong encapsulation of legacy JDK internal packages for now at runtime so that old code continues to run. We'll eventually strengthen the encapsulation of these packages once we've provided standard APIs for the critical internal APIs and once everyone has had a chance to fix their old code. When we do that, in some future release, code that uses JDK internal APIs will not run. In the meantime, here's an example of the kind of warning you might see if you haven't seen one of these already. This is Jython, a Python interpreter written in Java, running on JDK 9. These warnings tell you several things. They tell you that an illegal reflective access operation has occurred. They identify the code responsible and the internal API that it accessed. In this case, it's over in, in some of the internal new I.O. code. They suggest that you report this error to the maintainers of this library, so you can do your part to help bring the ecosystem forward. They tell you how to get additional warnings if you want to see them. By default, only the first such warning will be shown. Your application might have dozens or hundreds or thousands of others, and if you want to work ahead of the game, you might want to look at them. And finally, it does remind you that all legal access operations will be denied in a future release. To help you get ready for that future, when such code will not run, we introduced a new tool in JDK 9 called JDEPS. If you run JDEPS against an existing JAR file with the JDK internals option, it can detect via static analysis most uses of internal APIs. As an example, here it detected the use of Sun Security X509 X500 name, which is an internal API, and it even suggested down at the bottom a standard replacement. Note that says, since 1.4, that, that replacement has been there since Java 1.4, which shipped in 2002, which was 16 years ago. So there's really no excuse not to be using the standard replacement. OK, so the modular platform, it does break some things, but it doesn't break everything. If your code uses only standard Java SE APIs, then it will most likely work without change. I do say most likely here because there are some very minor differences. We've removed a few obscure, rarely used methods and mechanisms to enable a clean modularization. And there are some small behavior change, behavioral changes that honor the specification, but in, in rare cases, they might break existing code. If you want to know more, have a look at JEP 261, which lays out all of the compatibility-related changes in great detail. Beyond that, to learn more about the module system and the modular platform, I can recommend all three of these excellent books. So the modular platform enabled the second big change of the past year. We've reduced the platform by actually removing things for the first time in Java's history. Well, at least the first time on purpose. We removed the Java EE and Corba modules in Java 11. They're gone. Why? <clears throat> The details are all in JEP 320, but in a nutshell, all of these components are costly to maintain. They've been the source of multiple security vulnerabilities over the years. <clears throat> and nowadays, they're either available elsewhere, as in the case of Java EE, or they're really no longer that relevant, as in the case of Corba. We removed some other smaller things, too. As I mentioned, in order to modularize the platform cleanly, we removed some fairly obscure methods in Java 9. Most of these have to do with configuring property change listeners on various core APIs. Uh, frankly, these probably never should have been added in the first place, but there they were. We only removed these after analyzing lots of code out in the wild to see if anyone was using them, which hardly anyone was. While we were, we were at it, we also removed a pointless constructor that snuck into Java 8. Um, that was Brian's fault. <laughs> we removed more methods in Java 10. All of these methods are ill-defined, actively harmful, don't work, or don't do anything useful. We removed yet more such methods and one class in Java 11. Now, removing things can cause breakage, but to ease that pain, we always give advance notice by deprecating APIs to re be removed at least one release in advance, if not more. As an example of that advance notice, here are all the APIs deprecated in Java 11 for removal in a future release. 
you look closely, you can see that many of these uh, in are finalized methods in the core APIs. We're removing those because finalization is a fundamentally broken mechanism that we've replaced with something better. When an API is deprecated for removal, that's always noted in the API's javadoc. For example, this is a method, the javadoc for a method in the javalang runtime class. It's, call, it's named trace method calls. How many people have ever invoked this method? Nobody. Yep, that's what I figured. Um, so this method actually dates back to the very dark ages before we had just-in-time compilers. We only had bytecode interpreters. It's designed for controlling bytecode interpreter and requesting that, that method invocations be traced. As you can see, it's been deprecated for removal. It was intended to control method call tracing. It has been superseded by JVM-specific tracing mechanisms. Um, this really isn't any great loss. As you can see from the subtle and sophisticated uh, specification, not implemented does nothing. If you compile source code that uses an API that's deprecated for removal, then the compiler will, helpfully, warn you about it. Dr. Deprecator would be proud. So, popping back up. First, we modularized the platform. Then we trimmed it down. And then, we started moving it forward at a faster pace with a new release every six months. How can that possibly work? That's actually what I asked um, when, when it was first suggested a few years ago. Let's look at a timeline. We shipped JDK 9 last September. We shipped 10 this past March. We shipped 11 just seven weeks ago, and we'll ship 12 next March, and so on every six months, like clockwork. A feature release can contain any kind of feature, a language feature, a library feature, a performance feature, a JVM feature. It can even contain a feature removal. For this to work, features can go in only when they're nearly finished, because we can no longer slip a release in order to fix a broken feature. But that's OK. If a feature misses the current release, the next release is just six months away. So at the beginning of all this was, was JDK 9, the final massive JDK release. JDK 9 contained 90 JEPs, along with thousands of smaller enhancements and bug fixes. It shipped three years and six months after JDK 8 in 2014, with two major slips to the schedule. Oracle engineers did much of the work in this release, but not all of it. Six JEPs came from outside Oracle by contributors from Red Hat, Lenaro, SAP, uh, and a couple of, uh, of individuals, Doug Lee and Laurent Borges. Amongst these JEPs were three entire CPU ports, some significant performance work, and a new 2D graphics rasterizer. So after all that, w what was going to be in JDK 10? One worry we actually had about the six-month cadence is we might have zero features in a release. I mean, that's theoretically possible, right? If we're going to ship like clockwork, no features are ready. We'll ship a release. It'll have a nice number, but it'll just contain bug fixes and some small enhancements. Happily, that turned out not to be the case. JDK 10 contained 12 JEPs, including one language feature, local variable type inference, better known as VAR, more performance work, and a massive refactoring of the code base into a single Mercurial repository. Again, Oracle did much of the work, but two JEPs came from other contributors. Roman Kenke of Red Hat contributed a new GC interface uh, to the Hotspot JVM, and some engineers from Intel enabled heap allocation on alternative memory devices. This pattern continued in JDK 11, which had 17 JEPs, including some long-needed JVM improvements, a new HTTP client API, uh, the ability to launch single-file source code programs without compiling them yourself, and TLS 1.3, just in time, for the final internet standard. Oracle, again, did most of the work, but three JEPs were contributed by others. Engineers from Bellsoft and Cavium contributed some improvements to ARM64 performance. Alexei Shipilov of Red Hat contributed the Epsilon garbage collector. And Jean-Christophe Baylor of Google contributed uh, low ho overhead heap profiling. Finally, that brings us to JDK 12, still in development for delivery next March. There are five JEPs so far, all from Oracle, including a micro-benchmark suite for the JDK itself and two preview language features, switch expressions and raw string lit literals. These preview language features, they're preview in the sense that they're, not, they're in the JDK, but they're not enabled by default. They're there, there to encourage you to play with them, try them out, 
uh, and tell us what you think. Please do send us feedback uh, before we bake them in uh, and, and turn them on by default. If you'd like to do so, by the way, you can get the builds here. As you can see, what has changed is not the rate of innovation. We're still continuing to innovate at a healthy pace. What has changed is the rate of innovation delivery. In three years, by 2021 or so, we probably will have merged around 90 JEPs, just as we had in JDK 9. These feature releases aren't just about JEPs, of course. Each contains many smaller enhancements and, of course, bug fixes. As an example, according to our bug database, we resolved almost 2,500 issues in JDK 11. Oracle, resolved, Oracle engineers resolved most of those, but we had significant contributions from engineers at other companies, including SAP, Red Hat, Google, and Bellsoft, uh, along with a handful of individuals. Ret returning to our timeline, the six-month cadence will enable Java to compete well with other platforms. But you might be wondering, what about updates? What about security fixes? What about patches to critical bugs? The plan in the OpenJDK community is to update the current feature release for at least six months. That's two quarterly update releases. And then every three years, we'll declare a long-term support release. The first is JDK 11, shipped this past September, and the next will be JDK 17 in September of 2021. If you'd like, you can imagine JDK 8 way, being way at the top there as the long-term support release that preceded 11. Each of these long-term support releases will be updated well past the beginning of the next long-term support release and possibly even longer. Now, because of this pattern, you might think that non-LTS releases are in some way experimental. Oh, it's just a fancy name for a beta. You don't need to take it very seriously and you shouldn't really use it. No, that's no, completely untrue. Every release is production ready. What differs is only the support timeline. So you have a new kind of choice to make. You can take the blue pill or the red pill. You take the blue pill, you wake up in your bed and continue to develop and deploy on comfortable, conservatively managed, and slow-moving long-term support releases with an update release every quarter and a major migration every three years. You take the red pill, you go down the rabbit hole, where you can enjoy the latest language features, API enhancements, performance improvements, and bug fixes with a minor migration every six months. It's up to you. All I offer is the truth. <laughs> if you do choose the LTS path and take the blue pill, you might be wondering who will produce your update releases. Again, you have a choice to make. Since, J Since JDK 9, Oracle contributors in the OpenJDK community have focused and will continue to focus primarily on feature releases rather than on updates. Oracle will ship OpenJDK builds under the GPL for the first six months of each feature release, the GA release plus two updates, whether the release is a long-term support release or not. After that, Oracle will offer long-term support builds, but in a change from the past, these will be available only under a commercial license that allows free use for development and testing, but requires payment for use in production. Now I know that might sound scary, but don't worry. Java is still free. All of the code is still available under the GPL for anyone to build, test, publish, update, and support. Oracle engineers won't contribute to much less lead the LTS releases as they have in the past. <clears throat> but the OpenJDK community as a whole has a proven track record of transitioning the leadership of update releases from Oracle engineers to non-Oracle engineers. We did that for JDK 6 and JDK 7, and I expect we'll do it again for JDK 8 and then JDK 11. This is not just my personal fantasy. Andrew Haley, Red Hat's Java platform lead, lead, has assured everyone, for example, whether by Oracle or Red Hat or someone else, JDK LT LTS releases will continue to be supported. We all have a lot invested in Java, and we won't let it fall. So the LTS work will carry on in the OpenJDK community as it has in the past. 
you'll be able to get carefully built, well-tested JDK L LTS builds based upon that source code in most any Linux distribution, whether derived from Red Hat, Debian, Gentoo, or Arch. If you're not on Linux, you'll be able to get LTS builds for free from a variety of providers. Now, for this plan to work, it's critical that you be able to switch from one provider to another, whether from Oracle to someone else, or from, from someone else to Oracle, or from someone else to someone else. In past releases, that wasn't possible, since Oracle always held back a few so-called commercial features that were available only to paying customers. This included application class data sharing, Java Flight Recorder, Java Mission Control, and the Z Garbage Collector. To enable such switching, and to establish a level playing field, over the past year, Oracle open-sourced these commercial features. So now Oracle builds and OpenJDK builds are functionally interchangeable. You can switch from one provider to the other as you please. When you choose a provider, you might want to consider those with a depth of knowledge that comes only from a long-term investment in the platform. You have a choice. You can take the blue pill or the red pill, you can choose the conservative LTS path and take the blue pill with a major migration every three years. This can be a good choice for conventional enterprise-style deployments of large applications on large servers. Or you can choose the aggressive feature release path and take the red pill with a small migration every six months. This can be a good choice if you're deploying to the cloud or to app stores, embedding the, the, the Java modules that you need right with your application. If you choose the LTS path and take the blue pill, then you shouldn't ignore the non-LTS releases. A bit of advice. If you maintain an infrequently migrated system, then you should still test it with each non-LTS release. That way you'll be nearly ready for the next LTS release by the time it's available. You can spread the migration effort out over time. If, on the other hand, you choose the adventurous feature release path and take the red pill, you're going to migrate to each feature release as it becomes available, so make sure that your tools and dependencies can keep up. Many will be able to keep up, but some won't, especially if they're essentially unmaintained, so plan with care. To sum up, we're evolving the platform at a more rapid pace. We're doing this in order to keep up with competing platforms. We have broken a few things, and we'll continue to do so in order to make Java a better fit for modern applications. Are these changes really all that scary? No, I don't think they are, for four reasons. First, we'll always give advance notice before removing anything. We'll only do so when there's a very good reason. We don't want to break an un co existing code unnecessarily because after all, compatibility remains one of the core values of the Java platform. Second, you have a choice to make, which you didn't have before. You can take the blue pill and migrate every three years at a comfortable, stately pace, or you can take the red pill and enjoy the latest features and fixes every six months. Third, it's true that Oracle will no longer provide free long-term JDK updates, but Java is still free. Free updates will be available from a variety of other providers, including all the major Linux distributions. If you want active support rather than just updates, you're probably going to have to pay someone or else do it yourself. But that's always been the case, so choose your provider wisely. Fourth and finally, yes, we did break a few things. Migrating past Java 8 may require some work, but it might not be as hard as you think. All three of the major IDEs already support most of the new language features. Many popular tools, libraries, and frameworks already support JDK 9, if not JDK 11. And you don't have to take my word for it. As you may recall from last year, just after Java 9 was released, I asked on Twitter, do you maintain a popular Java library, framework, or tool? If it works fine on JDK 9, then please reply with its name and version. That was a year ago. So shortly after JDK 11 was released, I asked, do you maintain a popular Java library, framework, or tool? If it works like heaven on JDK 11, then please reply with its name and version. Thanks to Sam Brannon of the JUnit team for that hashtag. There were many, many responses. All 93 of these libraries, frameworks, and tools work just fine on JDK 9. Some worked without change. Others, in other cases, their maintainers fixed them. In many of those cases, it wasn't that hard. This list includes the build tools, Ant, Maven, and Gradle, 
test frameworks, JUnit and TestNG, popular libraries such as ByteBuddy, Jackson, Log4j, Hibernate, Juke, and Jetty, and the entire Spring framework. 51 of these components work not just fine on JDK 9, but like heaven on JDK 11. Since that transition from 9 to 11 is much easier than the transition from 8 to 9, I expect that the rest of them will catch up in short order. My most urgent advice to you today, then, is this. If you're using Java 9 or later, upgrade to the latest versions of all your tools and dependencies. Because everything changes, and nothing stands still. Don't believe a word I've said. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Nice talk. All right. Thank you, Mark. That was really awesome. Um, what he did forgot to mention is that we have a lot of related talks to uh, these subjects. So we've got Project Loom, uh, which we, we will have on Friday morning. If you still have questions, we have uh, a Q&A with the architects. Uh, there's a pro I think there's also a talk on Valhalla, if I'm not mistaken, and so on. So we've got lots of this uh, content covered where it goes a lot deeper on the subject. Um, so we have a, a small change of plan in the agenda. And um, I need to go to my computer first. Let's see if that works. Um, because we, we like surprises. And we, we've got a nice surprise for you in store. Are you ready for this? Let me close my slides. I would like to welcome the father of Java, Mr. James Goshlin. <laughs> welcome to DevOps. I'll give you my Hi. clicker. Hi. So uh, there. So um, after my like seven years vacation doing uh, robots in the ocean. I'm back with a real job. So for the last year and a half, I've worked for Amazon Web Web Services, and mostly what I work on is sort of embedded device stuff, IoT things. Um, but I get um, dragged into the into the Java world a lot. Um, I've really enjoyed being a Java user rather than a, 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 a producer and getting caught in all the all, all the all the fights. Um, Technology, yay. <laughs> Working? All right. Because it's a PDF viewer, so maybe it's just the next one. Yeah, just here. Just yeah, OK. Up. So um, Amazon really does, does love Java. Um, Java is a very big thing inside Amazon. Uh, thousands of services run Java every day. It's, it's, it's easily the most, most widely used implementation technique for these very, very large scale um, giant services. But sort of regrettably, historically, Java or Amazon's been kind of closed up about that, despite the fact that we have, you know, our own internal support group that's, that's, that's quite large and does a really good job of sort of production support for an installation that's the, that covers like a mind-boggling amount of traffic and a mind-boggling sort of number of a applications and, and servers. So what we're doing today is we're announcing something that we call the, the Coretto project, Amazon Coretto. And, and what it is is a, is a Really, it's a, it, it's a distribution of the OpenJDK that we're making available publicly to, to, to um, developers everywhere um, at no cost. And we're, we're doing multi-platform builds, so it's not just like inside the, the Amazon cloud, and it's not just the, the um, Amazon flavors of Linux. It's, it's, it's kind of everything. So um, it, it's, it's just an a downstream uh, distribution of OpenJDK. It is literally the platform that Amazon runs on, um, or an awful lot of the services run on. Um, and, 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 it, and, it's, and it's, 
it's incredibly solid, right? So it's got all of uh, all of our support work, um, and it's and, and and it's a complete drop-in replacement. When we um, long ago converted from uh, the, 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 the JDK to open JDK, um, there was a lot of apprehension in all of our engineering teams, but in actual fact, it just happened. It was, it was straightforward. And one of the things that we're doing is that we're providing uh, no cost long-term support. So for you know, things like, like JDK 8, we'll be providing long-term support for um, a very long time. We'll be doing quarterly releases of, of everything. We may do more often uh, releases if, if, if the opportunity uh, re requires. And it's an, it is 100% a, a drop-in replacement for any of the other uh, OpenJDKs. And one of the things that we're doing is making sure that it's very multi-platform. So it runs on Linux, Windows, Mac OS, Docker. Um, we're making uh, versions available and builds available so that developers can run it on their own systems. They can run, you can run it on your laptop, you can run it in, uh, inside your own uh, data centers, you can run it wherever you want. Um, and we're doing a, a fairly long list of, of, of Linux distributions. We're certainly doing um, uh, Amazon Linux and Red Hat and, and Ubuntu. Um, and those ones are what's going to start out um, you know, pretty much now. So if you go to our, our website, um, the, the, the preview is up there already. And when I say preview, the preview, the preview quotes are mostly about the packaging. Um, it, in fact, is the release that Amazon runs on. Um, and there are, there are builds for Amazon Linux and Windows and Mac OS and Docker. Uh, the Docker coverage right now is a little sketchy. There's a little, little, little more assembly required than there ought to be, but that's, that's getting fixed. And then uh, by the beginning of next year, uh, we'll be making that generally available, and that will have long-term support till at least 2023. Um, and and by then we'll have um, added support for Canonical's uh, Ubuntu and and Arhel. Um, in actual fact, you know the, the the ones that it actually runs on, and the ones that we will officially support. Um, you know, the official support tends to lag what it actually runs on. Um, and, and sometime in the first half of 2019, we'll be uh, making it generally available for uh, OpenJDK version 11. And that, that, that will also have a long-term support trajectory that's completely free. Um, we will be providing long-term support up to 2024. And the long-term support builds will be available to everyone um, for a long, long time. Um, historically, Amazon's not been as good at collaborating as we should be in, in open source projects, and I kind of apologize for that. But with, with Coretto, we will be um, changing all of that. So all of our patches will go upstream. Um, we will be you know, working with the community really, really heavily on you know, all kinds of you know, fixes of various sorts. Um, and we will also be working with, with Red Hat and others on the, on the JDK up, update project. Um, so you can get started with this immediately. It's, uh, it's at amazon.com slash Coretto. Um, and as I said, it's, it's, an, it's a distrib distribution of OpenJDK that's fully supported by Amazon on a lot of platforms. And if you have questions, um, we'll be in booth 13. We have a breakout session tomorrow at 10.40 a.m. in room 9. And tweet any questions using hashtag Coretto. And if you're curious where the name Coretto comes from, um, Coretto is a, is a form of coffee popular in, Ita in Italy. If you order a Cafe Coretto, what you get is an espresso with a shot of 
cognac or grappa or whatever. Um, so if you need a shot, get a Coretto um, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks. Thank you, James. Thank you. Oh, I forgot. We have a, a the, the, because it's me and it's a tradition. Um, we have to do something silly. <laughs> um, what do you do? Oh, oh you want to do it? No, you want to do that first. Yeah. Okay. You get your team members in place. Yeah. Remove your badge so that way you can nicely see your logo. All right. We got to do the selfie thing. <laughs> get closer. Yeah. yeah. I know. All you guys in the back row smile. <laughs> Oh, come on. All right, cool. All right. Where now, are the t-shirts? Now, now, the, now the important part, where are they? So you didn't bring your gun, uh, James? No, I, I didn't have, well, Chris, the you... one that would have gone through security was broken. OK. <laughs> and all the interesting ones are, these days, hideously illegal, so. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, we should go to room five as well, and so they can get some T-shirts. Go uh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> All right. Cool. Thank you very much, James. All right. Thank, thank you. you. All right, so that's really exciting. And I would like to thank Amazon to actually announce this at DevOps. This is really great, of course. Um, so we still have 50 minutes. And of course, um, I had a logistic, I always have a logistic problem with our next keynote speaker. Last year, I scheduled him as a conference talk. And I anticipated that there were going to be a lot of people. So I anticipated an overflow room. Now, he's the only speaker who can overflow the overflow room. So I said, like, OK, not this year. What I'll make sure is that he can overflow all the rooms. So I invited Venkat to give our keynotes. And I would like to welcome him uh, to, to on stage. Venkat, it's all yours. Thank you. Welcome to DevOps. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much for having me here, and thanks for everyone to be here as well. I want to talk about things that uh, excite me a lot, which is about thinking about programming. And, uh, and if, I, if I think about what I really like doing, there are two things I probably enjoy the most in my life. And one is, of course, writing code. And the other is uh, to hike mountains. And one of the reasons I like to hike mountains is it gives me an opportunity to be away from computers and gives me an opportunity for me to spend some time thinking about programming again. And, and that's one of the things I enjoy, really, is to think about what we do and how we can do better. And uh, over the years, I've, I've been excited about the paradigms of programming and how we can actually improve what we do. And in all honesty, when I started programming, I really got interested in it for the science and engineering and the math in it. But what really kept me as a programmer for nearly 35 years now is really the art in programming. And I would sometimes sit down with code and spend sometimes three hours, four hours, five hours just working on a piece of code to make it just a little bit more elegant. If I can remove three or four lines of code from it without losing the readability, that would really excite me a lot. And, and so I really admire languages' capabilities a lot, and what languages can provide for us is very important to me. But of course, we all are seeing changes ahead of us. And what I'm going to talk about today, there are a few things you can currently do in Java fairly well. And there are a few things I'm going to talk about today you cannot do in Java right now, 
but you will be able to do that maybe within the next two or three releases. And maybe a few things I'll talk about that will happen in the maybe six or seven years from now. But, but what's exciting is Java is changing very rapidly. And I'm honestly really happy for that because I was one of those guys on the other side of the picket line constantly complaining that Java sucks. And for me to be here to praise the language, actually, I think it deserves every bit of that merit because lang the language itself has evolved so much better for uh, really good reasons over the past several years. So I want to talk about you know, how things are changing so fast, and things change really fast in the world of computers, we say. Well, it reminds me of an experience. I was walking through uh, with, my with my son through the stores, and uh, you know, we were talking about how things evolve. You know, uh, we talk about how computers were back in time, and then how we have seen so many different types of computers and, and, and devices to uh, uh, things we are using today. But as I was walking with him in the, in, in the store, I came across this correction fluid. And, and, and I said, hey, look, there's a correction fluid. And as a curious child, he asked me, what's a correction fluid? And I told him, oh, correction fluid is what you use when you type on a paper to make a correction to it. You put this white on it and then retype on it. And then he said, what does it mean to type on a paper? And then I told him, oh, this is exciting. Um, when dad went to uh, college, he had to write an honors thesis. And you know, grandma actually typed it for your dad. And then, and then uh, using a typewriter. And then he said, oh, what's a typewriter? <laughs> and that's when I realized how disconnected we are from the past. And I ran home before he could get home, went into my closet and hid the floppy disk I had, because I never want him to see this. And, and the point is that we have lived over the past several years where we see technologies come and technologies disappear. It's just amazing for us to live this day. And I'm just curious, what are we going to see in the future as we go through? But there's a lot of changes that's happened in the past 50 years or so. And uh, there are going to be more changes ahead. So I'm always curious, with all the things changing around us, what are we seeing in programming? Well. I always like to run into friends who talk about how mainframes were once upon a time, where the machines would occupy rooms like this size and generate more heat than you can imagine. And now, of course, we have all that processing power on a small device like this, probably even more power on this. And this really intrigues me. And the reason it intrigues me is I go through, I, I travel around the world, and everywhere I go, I see people on their devices, using the devices. And I always pause and take a look at what they do with the devices. And I'm here to tell you what I found to be the consistent use of these devices. I really admire the human quest to create new powerful devices so fellow human beings have options like never before to play solitaire. Because this is what I see people do all the time. And what a waste of resource, really, if you think about it, right? But, but the beauty of this is we have multi-core processors on all these devices now. And, and we have a very different world we live in as we move forward. And so the question is, how are we programming in the new world? But what is the new world? We are no longer developing applications for our employees to use. We are developing applications for real world customers to use. That's a very different scale. We're talking about big data. We're talking about large volume of data. We're talking about receiving data from flights as the flights are in motion. We're talking about social media feeds. We're talking about stock data being processed. We're talking about you know, watching atoms in movement. So the point really is, with all this capability, how are we programming in the new century? And, and, and I found a lot of us do this. And you're like, really? And this is kind of scary, isn't it? Because as the world has changed drastically, have we really kept up with our programming uh, languages and what we do? Well, sure, we are trying to change it, but is it at the rate at which we want it to change is the question. And one of the things I'm always scared about is not just writing code using the semantics of verbosity, but what happens, how many of you work from home? Oh, quite a few of us, very dangerous, right? Because if you have a kid running into the room while you're coding, you want to immediately shut the laptop. Otherwise, they look at this and say, that's what you do for a living? 
and they never want to take after a profession, isn't it? Because that kind of verbosity scares the heck out of anybody, isn't it? So that's not where we want to be in general. So what can we expect moving forward? What should we expect moving forward? Well, some things are fundamentally hard to change, and they're so much the way they are. For example, languages we're programming are uh, uh, Turing complete, and, and I'm thankful for that. Well, there's so many varieties of them, but Turing completeness doesn't talk about elegance. Turing completeness doesn't talk about efficiency. Turing completeness doesn't talk about performance. Turing completeness simply says, well, you can solve this problem in this language, a general purpose language. It doesn't talk about any of the other variety of things we need to really care about. And we still are dealing with von Neumann bottleneck in terms of processors and the capabilities we are dealing with. And as we work on to move towards future, I'm, I'm beginning to rethink about this quite a bit. Uh, the, I, I grew up in the world of parallel computing. My dissertation was related to parallel computing, but I'm beginning to think maybe we've gone overboard with it. Maybe concurrency is not the right solution, given the fact that we are moving towards such a distributed uh, cloud computers. Maybe concurrency is not as important as we thought once. Maybe asynchrony is more important. And Java has always been strong on concurrency, but asynchrony is something we are beginning to see more and more in terms of the JVM and the implementations. You know, uh, we talked about you know, things like Project Loom that's going to be really doing things in this direction. Maybe there's a possibility out there for us to think about. Well, let's think about this for a minute. At the speed of development we talked about, we, we always keep hearing people say, things change really, really fast. So let's think about things changing really fast for a minute. What year was object-oriented programming introduced? Well, it turns out it was introduced back in 1967. It was introduced in 1967 by Dahl and Nygaard, two Norwegians, and they came up with this initial idea and presented, hey, we could really program with objects. So this was 1967. And when did object-oriented programming become mainstream? Like, everybody quietly used it. I remember being a very young programmer and constantly reading about these fighting. Object-oriented programming rocks. Object-oriented programming sucks. This will never succeed. Oh, this is lovely. And then suddenly, nobody was complaining. Nobody was talking about it. And they were quietly coding away. And that year was about 1990, give or take a few years. But if you really think about it, 1967 to 1990, what is that, about 23 years? If OOP was a human, it had a terrible childhood. Nobody cared about it until it was 23. Hey, handsome, you want to hang out? And this is just unbelievable. It took 23 years for something to become mainstream. Well, what year did functional programming, was, was it introduced? Well, we know that one of the first functional programming languages was Lisp back in the 1950s. But if you really think about the mathematical underpinnings of it, Lambda Calculus, when did that get introduced? Well, everyone here knows of Alan Turing. This was Alan Turing's professor, Alonzo Church, who introduced Lambda Calculus in the 1930s. And if you really think about it, a good 80 plus years later, we are just getting warmed up. So when people t tell me that things change really fast in our field, I always ask the question, what are you smoking? <laughs> because things don't change as fast as we think it does. We just want to think that it changes. In fact, we change at a snail's pace in reality. And to the point of frustration, if, if you will, but I was thinking, why are things so slow in changing? Why does it take so much time for us to really change? Why is the adoption curve really slow? I mean, you could ask, you know, uh, one of the favorite things for me to ask in conferences is, I would ask people, what version of Java are people using? And, and you would hear people still using Java 6, still using Java 7, and, and into maybe 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 years of an adoption curve, and the same thing with other languages as well. I, I was once curious, I went to the .NET folks and I asked them, hey, is that things are just slow in Java, what about you? And they had exactly the same reflection. People are still behind several years in adopting to language versions in, in C Sharp or other languages on the .NET platform as well, and other languages too. 
And I was thinking, asking the question, why are things taking so much time? And I came to a few realizations. Well, the, the very good saying, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So looking back and, and realizing what's happened can be really helpful for us. And it turns out that programmers don't adapt too well. And, and when I, uh, this is a generalization, of course. I'm not talking about one specific person. You could point to somebody around you and say, hey, look, this dude always changes very quickly. And in fact, I would argue a lot of us are exceptions to the rule, but we are not really the masses. There are you know, maybe 15 million programmers out there for every person in this room who is not going to change as much as we want to change. And, and it turns out that programmers don't adapt too well. And we actually take change in bite size. If you really think about it, why is the Java syntax so much like syntax of C++? Why is the C++ syntax so much like C syntax? And, and why is the for loop looking the way it does? And there's a reason for it. And one of the reasons is a lot of programmers want a bite size change. You don't want to thrust a completely different environment on them. It's really hard for us to comprehend that. And we are really good at dealing with these little bite-sized changes, a delta. Hey, I know this. I can learn this a little increment. I can learn this little increment. I can learn this little increment. And suddenly, look, I've come this far, but I did that in small steps. It becomes really easy for us to adapt. And I, I'm not saying this as a negative. I'm saying this as being pragmatic. And there's a really good reason to take these bite sizes. But there's another thing that really intrigued me, and that is that it's really hard to change our habits. And it almost takes a new generation. And, and this is one of the things that just absolutely blew my mind. I was giving a keynote in a conference. I was up on stage. I was talking. And I had a good time giving the talk. And I finished my talk. And I came down and sat down in the chair. And there was a very nice young lady sitting next to me, and she looked at me and said, hey, that was a really nice uh, uh, keynote. Thanks for coming and giving the talk. I said, absolutely, I'm delighted. Thanks for you know, coming here. And then she said, can I ask you a personal question? I said, no, 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 we don't do personal questions. Thanks for coming. We're done. And she said, no, 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 I really enjoyed your talk. I really admire what you said. I really, please answer this one question for me. I said, I'm really not good in personal questions. I would rather not. And she said, no, please, this once. I said, OK, fine. What's your question? And then she said, what year did you graduate from college? I said, no, 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 we're not doing this. <laughs> and she said, no, no, please, please tell me. I'm just curious. And then I said, OK, fine. And I told the year. And, and before I said this, she said, she graduated two years ago with a master's program, and she's been working for two years. You know, if somebody has finished a master's program and has been working for two years, you kind of can age, gauge their age, how old she is. And then she said, what year did you graduate? I said, I told the year. And the minute I mentioned it, her just face blossoms and says, really? That's the year I was born. <laughs> and I looked at her and said, could you please do me a favor? And she said, what can I do for you? I said, could you please get my cane from there? I need help walking. And all of a sudden, my gray hair, hair, hair turned grayer. And I went back to the room that night and I was thinking about it. And I said to myself, how exciting this is for me to work in this field with somebody who was not even born when I graduated from school. This is a next generation of people. And when the ne next generation come up, they don't have the constraints that I once had just like I didn't have the constraints that people before me had once when I was young. And when those young people come over and they look at us and say, why are you doing that again? And you're like, well, because. And then they will listen to all the patients and say, and why are you doing that again? And then I realized what an amazing world we live in. Because every 10 years, there's a new generation. And if you are a little older, you see the third generation, and then the fourth generation of programmers. And every generation that comes in has a new idea, a new thinking. And for every generation that comes in, a generation leaves. And I realized this is amazing, because for change to be effective, this is the true genius of the nature. Because nature has a built-in garbage collector. 
and it just pushes things away for the new things to come in. And that just made me so much happier because the new generation will come up with better ideas than we were ever capable of. And that's what you're seeing in languages as well because we are talking about one language right now. But honestly, it's not the same people working on those languages. It's a different set of people, different set of ideas, different set of changes. And the reason a language is vibrant is because you got newer people coming in and putting their ideas into it. And that, to me, is absolutely phenomenal. So we're poised for a really few good big changes moving forward. But it turns out it started about 10 years ago, or maybe 12 years ago. And this change has been slowly happening, but it's been accelerating over the past few years. And the question is, what are the things we are seeing? One, of course, is changes in the hardware. There was a day the engineer walked up to his boss and said, boss, I tried to pack more into it, but it melted, couldn't take the heat. And we had to really put multi-core processors, and that is one big change. The hardware around us has changed. The second thing that's changed is the business domain we are working in. We're looking at handled devices, we're looking at big data, we're looking at IoT, a lot of things around us have changed. So the hardware is different, the business world is different, and right in the middle is, is us trying to program these things on the devices for the business that we're going to deliver these to. And we're seeing these changes. We are looking at modern demands. We're looking at cloud computing. We're looking at big data, microservices, IoT, machine learning, AI, a lot of things we are looking at in terms of how we can adopt to this. And we have some answers already, but not entirely you know, uh, complete. We have uh, looked at improvements in NoSQL, MapReduce algorithms, uh, reactive programming. People often ask me, is functional programming going to be the big deal? And I always tell them, no. Reactive programming is going to be the big deal because I see reactive programming as functional programming plus plus. I see a lot of things where it builds on the abstraction of these ideas. And if you really look at the old web, the old web was really built with a great amount of fragility on it. We have the stateless request and response APIs. And how does it really feel to use this? You make a request to a server. It pushes HTML back to you. This is the old web. And you go back and make a request again, and it pushes the HTML back to you. And this is like you and I meet this afternoon, and we have a nice conversation. And tomorrow morning, you meet me at breakfast. You have to reintroduce yourselves all over again because I have no recollection of ever seeing you. And how kind of boring that would be. And that's not the way we work. That's not the way we communicate. We sit down and we talk about something today, and tomorrow morning we hit off with the conversation where we left because we remember what we talked about. So what if the conversational state can be carried through? How would we uh, program our systems? And, and this is one of the things, honestly, I am really excited about looking forward is the ideas of continuations. You, you're going to hear a lot about Project Loom as you move forward. And, and to me, when people talk about, hey, coroutines are awesome. And I'm like, yeah, coroutines are cool, but the real awesomeness, in my opinion, is in continuations. Because that's where the real building block is for us to be able to do a lot of these things. And if you really ask me, what am I really looking forward in the next several years on the JVM? And I would say the answer to that is continuations. So, so what is con continuation something we've heard about for a long time? Uh, I, I probably heard about it maybe 15 years ago. And, and for me to be able to do that on the languages that I normally use every day is very remarkable for me to uh, do. So what does it really do? You can save the execution state and return to the point later in time. I want you to think a little bit about lambdas if you want to think about it that way. So, but rather than thinking about lambdas, let's go a little further, think about closures. But what do closures do? A closure can carry a state with it. So a closure is a function that can carry a state with it. And, and, and as a result, what if you make a call to my uh, function, and when you make a call to my function, I'm going to return a data back to you, but instead of returning a data to you, what if I return a tuple to you? Where the tuple is going to be the data plus a closure. And once you consume the data, you can call into the closure, and suddenly I can start executing from where you left. And, and this can be completely abstracted by the language and the API, so we don't even feel it. 
I'm gonna give you a little example. This is not, I'm not saying this is a continuation, but I wanna give you an example that kind of shows how it feels like to be able to write code like this. I'm gonna give you an example here in JavaScript. I know that's a bit scary, but we can actually learn from other languages, including JavaScript as well. So here's a little example. Let's say I wanna create a little function right here, and I'm gonna call this one as let's talk. And, and this let's talk function simply says, I'm going to provide as a function, let's just start with a very little thing, I'm gonna say init. So we all know generally how do functions work. You call a function, there is an entry point into a function, and typically there is an exit point from a function. Well, in good programming, we try to keep a single exit point, but in you know, other programming, we could have multiple returns, and depending on the logic, you may return from any of those exit points. But typically, we have one single entry point into functions. But the question to ask, this is what I love about programming, is asking the question, but why? Why should there be a single entry point into functions? If you look at languages like Erlang, for example, it turns out there could be multiple entry points into functions. But not just the entry point alone, what if you can just have a conversational state in a function? How would that then feel? So for example, I'm gonna say a constant response of let's talk, and I'm going to start iterating through here on a response this function is going to return. But what is this function going to return? It simply says yield, and I'm gonna simply say hello for now. But of course, this is a syntactical sugar here in JavaScript. I'm going to simply say, go ahead and call the init, and when you get the response, I want you to display the response for me. Like I said, I just want to show this as a, how does it feel kind of an example. Well, where it really takes us from here is, we could potentially go back here and say, uh, you know, uh, uh, again, and then of course, we could say there, and we can have multiple entry points through this, and there is a conversational state we can continue with the code. So in other words, how does it feel to be able to jump right into the middle of a function and execute right in the middle of the function rather than having to get back into the beginning of the function? And, and you can continue for this as much as you want to, and then you can say uh, yet again, and then of course you can continue providing a lot more yield points into this, and as a result, you can be having this conversational state. But what if we can do this for a lot of different code we can perform? What if the web will turn into something like this where we can return from a web call, but we can go right back to where we came from to continue with this particular process or conversation? And it can start changing the way we program, not just the web, but almost everything else we program can start changing very differently. And in all honesty, this is something that I'm absolutely excited for, to see where this leads us in terms of how we fundamentally change the way we program, given a new set of tools we can make use of at, at the particular uh, instance. Well, that's one thing that I'm really excited about, is to think about continuations and how that can work. But a language should make simple things simpler, and should really make hard things more manageable. And I'm really particular about it. Because when you're sitting and writing code, when you're struggling with a piece of code, you ask the question, why am I doing this? Now, if you really think about it, we live in a very different world today than we did 15, 20, 30 years ago. Today, we live in a world where you have people working with you and they are thirsty for ideas, and you tell them, oh, you could do this. And then the colleague is like, really? How would you do this? Let me show you. And the minute you say, let me show you, you realize, you got to write 70 lines of code to show you. You're like, never mind, let's talk about this after lunch. You want to be able to quickly prototype things and you know, show how things work, because to me, programming is a series of mini experiments. And, and that when that light comes through your mind, you want to carry that forward and say, hey, look, here's a potential, here's how this works. And, and seeing it inspires people to say, whoa, that's pretty awesome. I think I can take this idea now and carry this into production. So that kind of prototyping is extremely important, and I want languages to make that possible for us, and, and that really comes down to less ceremony. So how can we really reduce ceremony and make things better for everybody to use the language? So languages must promote higher level of abstraction they must promote composability, and also they should promote declarative style, because these tend to really provide that kind of facility to develop the languages moving forward. So the very first thing I want to talk about here is uh, expressiveness. 
And, and I have to say that Java is a lot more expressive today than it was maybe you know, 10 years ago, even five years ago. And it is more expressive now with every release of Java. Java is more expressive. And in honesty, this is something that I'm absolutely excited for because expressiveness makes me happy because I can focus on my code rather than on the ceremony. So as an example, what if we were to do something like this? You're going to see something like this in Java 12, but I'm not showing Java here, but I'm going to show this example here in Kotlin just to see how this feels like. So I'm going to write a process function. Let's take a value input integer. And what I'm going to do here is use a little uh, pattern matching syntax, if you will. And I'm going to simply say else. I don't have a clue what I'm you know, working with here. I'll simply say whatever. But I'm going to call process over here. And what if I send a value of 1? Call process here, send a value of, let's say, 15. And I want to work with these values. I could say 1. And I'm just going to simply print out a silly one to say, I got a value of one on my hand, and I want to display it. So all that I'm doing here is, of course, showing that this is a value of one that I've really received at this point. And as a result, you can see the output tells you that for a one, it's one, but whatever, it's whatever. But the beauty of this is, what if I can quickly work through some of these details? I'm going to say 13 to maybe I can say 19. And then I can say, if it is in those range of values, then what am I going to say? I'm going to simply say teen to say that this is a value which is within a teen. What if languages can provide me such capabilities where I don't have to work on writing a ceremonious code? Let's think about this a little bit further to see where this can take us in terms of expressiveness. When, when you're programming in a language, you want to be in sync with the language. I always say, whether it's a tool or a language, you are in sync with it where you're not even thinking what you're doing, and you are in good step. This is like finding the perfect love, isn't it? You complete the sentences for each other, you say the same things, and you go to the same movie, enjoy. I want the language to be in love with me, not just me in love with the language. And I want that kind of mutual love with each other. So when it comes to this, what if I want to change this a little bit here? What if I want to say this as any, just for a minute, just to entertain the thought for a minute? So I'm taking any value. But I'm going to ask the question, is it a string? And I'm going to go ahead and print out here a string. That's all I'm going to say. And I'm going to call process, and I'm going to say hello, and pass the string to it. But before we go any further, let's look at one thing. In the future, Java will do this for us too. But as of today, how do we write code in Java? Well, the way we write our, a lot of other languages, I'm not just speaking on Java here, a lot of languages tend to do this, unfortunately. And what, is, what do they do? I have a variable, let's say object, we'll call it as inst, and what am I doing? I say if instance uh, is instance of, and I'm going to say string. And then I'm going to simply say output instance.length. If I do this, you'll get a compilation error in languages. Now, why do we get a compilation error? Of course, anybody who programs in the language says, of course, Venkat, inst is not a type string. And what should I do? Then I painstakingly put a little parenthesis around it, and I put a little parenthesis around it, and then I say string, and the language is like, you're good now. Does anyone remember what this feature is called? I heard you say casting. Well, they call it casting, I call it punishment. Right? Why am I supposed to do this? Why am I forced to do this? And I always ask this question, I pause and ask the question, do you work for the compiler, or does the compiler work for you? And this is one of the things I always want to leave thinking. Am I working for the compiler, or is the compiler working for me? And a lot of times, I'm putting all this effort just to please the compiler. And the compiler says, keep working, I'll be back from lunch and I'm still coding away. I'm not even kidding with you. I was working on a project, and, and this gentleman and I were paired programming for eight hours a day. And sitting right around the corner in the same room was a very young Python programmer. Nobody liked him, because every few minutes, he would be coding, and he would look up and say, still fighting the compiler there, aren't you? You're like, why don't you be shut up and let us do our work, right? And, and, and that's the point where it gets really a burden. But the beauty is, what if languages can work with you and say, I'm with you. I know what you're doing here. And we are in sync. 
So I go back here and say a string over here, uh, off length, and then I'm going to simply say over here, n dot length and ask for the length of the string. And so when I run this code, it says a, a string of length five. Make no mistake, we are not simply arbitrarily doing this. This is not dynamic typing. Because if I were to go here, and if I ask for n dot length, the compiler yells at me and says, what in the world are you trying to do? Because the length is not valid on any. But on the other hand, within the context of this, it clearly knows that we are dealing with a string. And again, this is something that Java is going to do in the future. And all of a sudden, you don't have to write that silly code. You're walking along with the language where the language the compiler is walking with you, and you both are communicating. You don't have to say, remember I just told you this line before there's a string? You don't have to have that conversation. It suddenly feels like you're talking to an adult. And, and you're having a conversation with it. Similarly, for, in, from the point of expressiveness, what if I write a class called person? I'm going to say first, which is a string, and I'm going to say last, which is also a string, and I'm going to create a bunch of string values. I'm going to create over here, just as an example, let's say I want to create a, Alan is equal to a person, and in this case, of course, the person I want to create, I will just say Alan, Turing right here. And I'm going to ask it to uh, uh, print out the result of this. So I'm going to simply say print out Alan for me. Now, when I, when I do this, what is the uh, you know, result? That's a completely useless information, isn't it? But what am I going to do in that case? How do I really make it do something really useful? Oh, you could write a two-string method. And then you ask the question, but why am I doing it? Well, isn't this obvious? What are you going to do? You're going to mechanically type it. Well, when you're mechanically typing it, what a waste of time and effort typing it. I know some programmers tell me, oh, no, no, Venkat, you're wrong. When it is so mechanical, we never type it. We gently right-click on it. And the IDE vomits the rest of the code for me. <laughs> and what happens when it vomits? You still have to live with that vomit for the next seven years. But why? Why are we vomiting in the text file when this is so obvious? Shouldn't the compiler be generating in the bytecode than we doing it? So what if I go here and say, this is a data class, you do the rest for me. Like what? Write a two-string method, write a equals method, write a hash code method, write a few other things for me. And again, Java will be doing this in the future. But this is removing a lot of boilerplated code so it doesn't burden us, the programmer. So we don't have to really spend the time and effort maintaining that code when it can be done for us. So the code can become a lot more expressive. The code has to be composable, of course. Com because composability is a very important feature, and Java does this really well already. But once again, I'll quickly show you an example here. I'm going to say numbers over here is equal to, and I'm going to create a list of and I'm going to create a list of numbers over here, 1 to 10. And I'm going to say numbers, well, let's say val result is equal to. And I'm going to say numbers to begin with, but I'll go ahead and ask it to apply a filter. I'll say dot filter. But what am I filtering here? Oh, is even. Tell me if the number is even. Then I'm going to perform a map operation. Take the value and double the value for me. And then once I double it, what do I want to do? Just call the sum on it. And then when I'm done with it, of course, I want to print the result value that I have at my hand, so I can simply say print the result. What in the world is is even? I'm going to say is even is a function that takes an integer. It returns a Boolean, but what I'm going to do here is to simply say called. We'll come back to that in just a minute. And I'm going to simply return n mod 2 is equal to 0, let's say. So when I run this code, the result, of course, is going to be a result of whatever the computation is, in this case, a 60. But I'm going to go back here and say done for a second. But I'm going to go ahead and put this called just to illustrate the fact that this code is actually calling that method over and over as you would expect it to do. But ignoring that for a minute, if you look at this code, this is very highly expressive and it's composable. You are able to walk through the code. The code begins to relate the problem statement. Of course, you look at this and say, hey, I can do this in Java too. Absolutely. And that's what really got me excited about Java when I saw that it can do something like this in the language. But of course, beyond composability, make no mistake, there's a lot of languages that are composable, but they're not efficient. 
And Java will not survive if they did not provide efficiency. In all honesty, what sold me on Java, it was not composability, even though I said it is. It's the lazy evaluation that sold me on it. I remember clearly standing up at my desk and said, my goodness, this is awesome. Well, the reason I said that was, I'm used to composability in other languages. Ruby did this, Groovy did this, Scala did this, a lot of languages did this. And I was like, why do I care? But one difference is that Compared to all the other languages, the innovation in Java was how efficiently it's being done and it provides laziness. Now you could argue, well, why can't Java just do what these other languages did? And there's a really good reason why Java couldn't do that. If Java had done exactly that, I don't think we'll be here talking about it today. But the reason Java couldn't do it is Java is special in a lot of different ways. It's one language that is so much unique in this world. It's a language used by nine million programmers in the world, or maybe it's more today. But think about it for a minute. When nine million programmers use your language, and out of which one million people know where you live, you have to make decisions very differently. And that is the reason why Java took the time to do. You know, I was talking to somebody recently, and, and this person was saying, oh, I've been working on Project Loom for so long, it's going to take a few more years. And I said, don't hurry, please because I saw what you guys did for Java 8, and I couldn't be happier. So there's no reason to rush, because when you're done with it, I know it's going to be that good. And that's what I really want, is, is a solution that's not half-baked, but one that we can really stand by and make use of. And efficiency is extremely important in that regard. So going back to this code, as you can see, when you look at this code, my goodness, look at that. It's calling all that function over and over. What if I don't call the sum operation? And when I run the code, it is still executing every one of them. That's not efficient. And this is what sold me on Java. When I saw this in Java, I said to myself, ah, now I understand why they put stream on it, because they want us to know it's a semantical difference. The essence stream is for semantical difference right there. And, and, but on the other hand, though, I'm here in Kotlin, I can say as sequence, you have to really trigger that and say, yeah, don't bother. I want a lazy evaluation. Don't waste your time computing it. And so as a result, you can switch back and forth depending on what you want. If you do want the computation to be eager, you can exercise it eagerly in Kotlin. If you don't want the computation to be eager, you can also do that. So the language gives you a choice at this point, but you have to make a wise choice based on what you really want. But that kind of efficiency is very, very important. And one other thing that I care about a lot is uh, moving forward, like I mentioned earlier, I'm absolutely excited about asynchrony. And, and I think that more than parallelism, as much as my heart is in parallel programming, more than parallelism, I think we're going to be doing a lot more asynchrony. And, and this is one of the reasons why the future development in Java is so exciting for me, because I think we're going to do something phenomenal moving there. But at the same time, though, I want to emphasize, I don't want seamlessness. I want almost seamless. And the reason I emphasize almost seamless is, when you're dealing with semantical differences, you still want the programmer to be aware of what they are doing. Hiding it so much that the programmer doesn't realize what they're doing uh, is really problematic. The programmer feels cheated at first point, and second, it's error prone. And I've honestly worked in languages where it's so seamless, I programmed in the language for a while, and then I'm shocked in realizing I did not know that there was a semantical difference. So uh, I want it to be almost seamless, and that is absolutely uh, useful. Just to entertain a thought here, how this would feel like, let's look at one example here. So let's go ahead and say, in this case, uh, I want to uh, create a little example of uh, just a, uh, you know, a call that I want to make. So I have a function call. I'm going to call it as get pizza. Well, the get pizza is going to obviously go ahead and get a pizza. I'm going to simply say return pizza. And I'm going to return a pizza, but this is going to take a little time because it takes time to get pizza. So this is going to take maybe a two seconds to compute this. But on the other hand, I could also say, let's just go ahead and print out here so we can actually see it. So we can say get pizza called. And, and so this is going to be a get pizza call. Then I'm going to also go ahead and say uh, get drink. You can't start a party without a drink, isn't it? So I'm going to say get party, uh, get drink. And this is going to be a get drink call. It's going to return some kind of a drink. That's going to take a little bit of time as well. 
But if I'm going to execute this code, what am I going to say here? I'm going to say uh, pizza is equal to, uh, in this case, of course, get pizza. But then, of course, once I get the pizza, I could say drink is equal to uh, get drink. And I can call these methods, of course. But then, of course, I can finally print out whatever pizza and drink I have on my hand. A little silly example here, of course. But I'm going to print the pizza and print the drink, which is simply going to print those text, of course. But of, as we know, this code is going to be executing pretty much in, in serial uh, execution, isn't it? One step at a time executing this code. And, and as a result, if it's going to take some time to get pizza and some time to get drink, it's going to take that long to execute this code as well as you would expect from this output. So that's about a two second delay to run through and get the values. Let me fix the errors in just a second. So that's going to take really the time it needs to execute this piece of code. And, and what, what can I do to minimize this kind of computation? Wouldn't that be nice to really throw it off and say, you go execute this, and I want non-blocking call? So the whole point about asynchrony to me is non-blockingness. I don't want to be blocked on this call and wait on a response. I want to just set this off and run. And when the result arrives, I want to carry on and move forward and do things. So, so given this, what can we do with, with an example like this? So if I were to execute this one, of course, let's see what the error says here, if I can find that very quickly. So in this case, um, let's see. OK, it's still taking the time here. Does anyone see the error? I don't see it yet, but let's see. Oh, it's not happy with the fun. Let's see where I am, actually, in this case. Uh, yep, so I'm not sure, but anyway. So um, if I were to run this code, let me see if I'm able to see the error here on the command prompt. And then, of course, otherwise, I'll just talk about it. Um, so ah, there we go. That's the reason. It's a null and null. So um, where is the uh, execution here? So I'm going to call the get pizza function, execute the value, and get the result back from it. So what if I were to run this asynchronously? How would it feel like? to be able to run these code asynchronously. Well, one of the things that you can do in languages is simply fire up and say, run this async. So by executing it asynchronously, you can say, I don't want to block on this call, fire off and do the work for me. And then, of course, you can specify, I want to await on this. There's a lot more you have to provide for this in here to launch it, but you get the gist of what it is trying to do. So you can ask it to perform an operation, and you say, set this off and let it run. I don't want to block on the call, but when the response comes back, I want to take the response and execute it. Now, these ideas are not new. This has been around for a long time. They're definitely new for us within the Java language, but other languages on the JVM have done this quite a bit for a long time. But this is what I was talking about, almost seamless. It still gives me a clue that I'm actually trying to do something asynchronously, but at the same time, I don't have to really spend a lot of time and effort. And, and so where, where does this really go? One of the things that I really begin to appreciate is the structure of code. So what if the structure of code can be about the same, irrespective of what you do in terms of your implementation model? And, and this was the aha moment for me when it comes to streams. So what I learned from stream is that the structure of parallel code uh, is, is the same, almost, is the same as the structure of sequential code. So, but on the other hand, what if we can make a structure of asynchronous code uh, the, is the same as the structure of synchronous code? How would that feel? then your programming becomes a lot easier. You're able to write the code using sequential because it's easy for us to reason, easy for us to write, easy for us to debug. And once it's working, and when you need the performance, you can turn on a master switch, and you can turn it on either concurrent, or you can make it asynchronous, depending on what you're trying to do, and that would really remove that impedance mismatch for us. And if what if languages get to the point where we can use this, use a hygienic syntax within the language to be able to achieve that in our code, that would make a big difference for us as programmers. So given this, how can we really prepare for the future? How do we go towards this? And, and I'm always curious because my value to my company that I work for, for my business, is my ability to adapt very quickly. And the faster I can learn and the faster I can produce results, it's better. So how can I prepare myself for the future? Because the future, I think, is heading in these directions. And I will talk about one thing before we, we talk about that. And this is definitely something that intrigued me. 
This was a research study they did in Chicago. And what they did was they took children who are four to six years old. And they took these children who are four to six years old, and there, there were two groups of children. First group of children were children who only were exposed to one language, whatever that language was. I'm not talking about programming languages here, of course. Uh, some kids are, but in, in this case, natural languages. Well, they only were exposed to one language. Their parents spoke one language. They went to school where everybody spoke that language. Their association was, was with people who only spoke that language. The second group of people, children, were children exposed to multiple languages. These children were not speaking multiple languages but they were exposed to multiple languages. Their parents spoke one language, but their nanny spoke a different language, or their buddy in school spoke a different language, or their teacher spoke a different language. And when they did the study, they did something really weird. They, they took objects, and as an example, this particular person doing research, for, uh, if you don't mind, if you're that child in front of me, and they pointed and said, how many you know, uh, red-colored uh, lid bottles do you see? And the children who's, who are exposed to only one language, and their answer was, I see two. Because from the point of view, vantage point of view of the child, there were two bottles with the red lid. On the other hand, when the same exact question was posed to children who spoke, who were exposed to multiple languages, when that child was asked, how many red color bottles do you see? The child would glance around and say, one because the child was able to see it through the eyes of the person asking the question and clearly say, obviously the person doesn't see what's behind, they can only see what's in front of them. And so they were beginning to process information and communicate very differently. And this was very intriguing for me. These are children, and yet the fact that they were exposed, not even speaking, but exposed to multiple languages, completely altered the way they think and the way they communicate. And, and this is one of the things, in my own personal experience, I've learned over the years. I used to be a programmer who did programming in exactly one language. And then I realized how limiting that was, and today I program very dangerously in about 15 different languages. But every single language I pick up, I'm absolutely excited because it completely shakes my notion of what I know. And it makes me rethink about what I know, and I'm able to see things a little bit differently based on the eyes of the designers of these languages or the paradigms. So the amount of time we need, in my observation, to learn a new concept is inversely proportional to the number of diverse ideas we've been exposed to. If you've been exposed to very many different diverse ideas, I think you can learn something very quickly. But if you are exposed to fundamentally a few ideas over time, and every single new idea that we are exposed to becomes a pill battle, because our brain refuses to accept it, our brain refuses to even acknowledge it, and the transition is incredibly difficult. So I'm absolutely selfish. I want to reduce the time for me to adopt new technology. I want to deliver value quickly to my business, and, and as a result, I found that one way I can actually do that is to diversify my knowledge portfolio almost constantly every single day, if you will, and, and that really helps quite a bit. So learn different languages, that would be my recommendation, but not to use them all, because we can, that's dangerous thought to have, to use a lot of different languages on a project. So I learn languages not to use them, but to be able to adapt the changes quickly and easily as the language that we use evolve as time goes on. So every time we spend time learning something new, when the language we predominantly use evolves, it becomes incredibly easy to adapt to it very quickly. So I'm going to say, please don't wait for the future, because I think it's already here. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Venkat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. So that uh, concludes our uh, closing or opening keynote. Sorry. A few practical things. This evening at 7, 6.37 at the exhibition floor, we'll be serving fries and beers. So that way we can still socialize and get a, a bit of taste of Belgium culture. Uh, tomorrow evening, we have the closing keynote in room 5 at 7 o'clock with Brian Getz. 
And then followed by that closing keynote, we will have the movie, as you saw in the opening trailer, uh, First Man, which will be in room eight, and everybody who's coming will get popcorn. There is enough space, don't worry about it, so you don't have to stand in the queue even while the closing keynote is happening. Go to the closing keynote, enjoy it, and there will be enough space that's based on, well, what we've seen from the previous years. Now, we have a 30-minute break. Get some coffee. It's going to be crowded, so be professional. Uh, take your time, uh, go out, get a smoke, get some coffee, get some sugar, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Have a great conference. <laughs>